What do you know about Sid Waddell? Sid Waddell is a very famous darts commentator in this country. He comes from the North Country, Geordie accent, very famous for the 180. And that also... That wasn't very good, didn't you do it? Uh, 180! <laughs> <laughs> That's much we like that. You're a darts fan. I do. Do you that. remember our darts episode? Yeah, we've talked yeah. about darts. Well, this episode is 180! Yes, Sid Waddell? Sid Waddell, very, very well-read man. He's, his commentaries are famous for being interspersed with classical quotes of this, that and the other. And he knows a lot of stuff. Very good listening, really. Welcome to the weekly podcast from the weekly sofa. It is indeed... 180! 180. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, little Shocking. things do tickle us, don't they? Shocking. Anyway, this week we're going to find out about Ricardo and his curlies. I think he went out with Rachel Harris in very, very early one morning. Yeah. This morning. Yeah, yeah. indeed, indeed. We're going to hear about Rich and veggie plots because they're all going out from Wiggly Wigglers this week. All those veggie plots are winging their way to people all over the country to ready plant their plots with all veggies. Sorts. <laughs> veggies, in fact. All sorts. Yeah. Do they grow? All sorts. Chocolate. Oh, what oh, do they licorice. go into? Like a tree yeah. uh, covered in sweets. <laughs> Look, I'm the funny one. Sorry. Okay. I think <laughs> I find you are, yeah. That's a, yeah. I, was, I was forgetting myself there for a moment. Silly old sausage. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on on the farm, Farmer Phil? Have you let the cattle out? Well, we're getting there. Uh, grass is growing. We've just got one or two husbandry tasks, a little bit of dehorning to get done and get that all squared away. Cattle Did you notice how he itched his head when he said dehorning? Yes, yeah, dehorning. <laughs> well, I'm sure he must have been doing that when he was wandering around the corridors naked. <laughs> if you're not sure what we're on about, dear listener, do go back to episode 179 and have a listen to Farmer Phil in Aberystwyth. So, Rich, I know nothing about curlews at all. Can you give me the real basic information? Uh, Is it a complicated subject? <laughs> <laughs> are no, they it's not. peewits? Curlews, no, not peewits. Peewits are lapwings. No, uh, curlews, they've got the, the most wonderful thing. I think they're the largest European wading bird. They've got quite a long, bent beak that they use for probing. But they tend to spend most of their summers inland. Nesting, you know, there were. I think there was a time, and certainly, I think in the early nineteenth century, they were restricted to upland areas. But subsequent to that, they sort of moved down into lowland areas and started to nest and floodplains and things like that. But their fortunes have suffered dramatically over the last few decades because of the way agriculture has gone. And for a long time, they thought that their fortunes they were they were doing better than other ground nesting birds. But it, it, as things transpired, it, it, they're a, they're a longer lived bird. So I think they can probably go on for like twenty years or more, or something like that. Um, oh, an old bird. <laughs> so they can. Uh, and so people thought, oh, they're doing okay. They weren't sure why they were doing okay, but they. But uh, but you know, recently they've, they've realised that numbers have, have declined dramatically. Anyway, there's a beautiful place, the Lug Flats in, in Herefordshire, that just runs along the, the River Lug, that's uh, the tributary of the, our, our River Wye. And uh, it's an astonishing meadow, big area, you know, there's, there's literally uh, tens and hundreds of acres, really, of, of pasture that's left and managed for hay, you know, and grazing. So we're, Rachel and I walked down there this morning to see if we could hear the curlews because they've got the most amazing cry, haven't they? Very, that really plaintive, you know, it's sort of curly, 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 curly. And you tend to hear it Ooh. early in the mornings, you know, early in the mornings or last thing at night. I think what tends to happen is when they're nesting or when they've got chicks, they tend to shut up. You know, they're getting to the, probably the, the latter end of the incubation period, so, or there may well be chicks um, already. And, is this um, Richard so say, know, a, a, a way of saying so we that we are not we going to hear, hear the curlews? <laughs> 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 the well, it, to so be fair, fair the just, just now, sort of a few weeks' time, when it, when it starts to get hotter and sunnier, they'll go into making this fabulous burbling noise. When I've been up at the Hay Garden recently, I've heard them up there, you mm. know, and so there's obviously some pasture up there that they've uh, managed to secure. For some I'm afraid that uh, we, we used to have a lot in the grass seed. They'd like the grass seed crop. 
but I'm afraid that I'm yeah, going to level badges. the accusation at Brock and the Buzzards. Because, oh, we've um, heard this before, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go and listen to Not the Curlies. Well, we've just wandered onto, uh, onto the Lug Flats, an area, a fantastic area in Herefordshire, really, just on the outskirts of Hereford, uh, almost containing Hereford in some respects. And... Uh, you can hear the road in the background. Unfortunately, that's a really busy archery now. But I've come down with Rachel Harry's because uh, ideally we wanted to see if we could hear the curlews today. But if we don't hear them, then no matter because uh, what spans out in front of us is the most wondrous of sights. And at this time of year, where are we? Just coming towards the end of April. It's littered with the cuckoo flower or ladies smock. And we've seen all sorts of wonderful things thus far. And Rachel is lucky enough to live within spitting distance from this uh, wonderful site. Because this, this whole area is covered in water in the, in the winter, isn't it? Totally flooded, yeah, completely yeah. flooded. But then that's how it was planned to be. And you can actually see the channels that were dug to encourage the water to flood onto, onto the meadows. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think it's uh, one of the few instances where nature and the way things are supposed to be have, have been left alone because there's so many floodplains in Herefordshire that have just been uh, ploughed even ridiculous crops like potatoes planted in the floodplain so all the all the topsoil just gets washed down into the river every time it floods but in this instance this is really left for pasture and uh, and grazing and of course there aren't any animals on it at the moment because the uh, the grass is being left to grow for hay and consequently uh, ground nesting birds like our wonderful big old curlews have a chance to to come down and bring a family up on it and they are conspicuous by their absence today, Rach. But then you insisted on coming in the morning, and I did tell you that I used to, I hear them in the evening. Oh, and I have been telling you, did I've you? been hearing them okay. for months. It's always just I? convenient. It's <laughs> <laughs> just my convenient hearing when you're speaking to me. I just, I just, <laughs> I'm not paying enough attention, evidently. <laughs> but yeah, perhaps it was, uh, perhaps it was a psychological thing as well. I mean, I just wanted to come down in the morning because it's a, it's a beautiful spot, isn't it? It's amazing, you know. It's just an expanse of, of the most wonderful grassland imaginable. Now, you know that these are known as Lammas Meadows, Richard. Do you know anything about Lammas Meadows? No, nope. you share it with me. Shall I tell you? I yes. might get it wrong, right. but the meadows are grazed as common land right. during the winter yep. from Lammas Day, which I think is August, perhaps, until February, or when it gets too wet, too wet, they're grazed, so we have cattle on here. OK. That is... Yeah, a couple of farmers are allowed to do that. So is Lammas then, Day something just a marker? Is that is it is Lammas yes. the, uh, yeah. the specific term for the for the day that marks the beginning of the grazing season? Reed bunting. Look, that's a little reed bunting, and that's an incredible thing to see. And that's what was cursing us earlier on. From the tree. And that's a beautiful <laughs> bird, and with a lovely. I mean, they've got a really ready sort of back to them, and a, and a fantastic black cap and a lovely white band. Beautiful little bit, about the same size as a great tit, I suppose. And I reckon he's probably, his missus was the one that was cursing us, and they're probably bringing up their family along this, this drainage channel that we're walking along now. Now, so like, right, the thing about the Lammas Meadows is mm-hmm. that when they're grazed, they're grazed by just a couple of farmers who are allowed to put the cattle on. Um, but when the cattle have to come up and it's left, the grass is left to grow for hay, yeah. the meadows are owned in strips okay. by local people. Right. So... There's markers. If we walk down to the river, we can see stone markers. I think that they're actually new and they've been replaced and you can see some of the old ones by the Nature Trust headquarters. But what happens when it comes to haymaking time, I can look out of my my flat and you can see that the farmers will take their hay from one patch, from one bit. They're not thin strips, they're quite sort of wide strips. And he'll make straw round bales there, yeah. and then the next one will come along, and he'll be harvesting on a different day, right. and he'll be making square bales, okay. and then the next one will make round bales, and you can see how the different patches fit together right. because of who's haymaking on which day. Oh uh, wow! There you are. You see. And it's it makes an perfect ancient, sense. It goes back to medieval times. This way of managing the land here, mm. and these meadows here are apparently the most significant example of Lammas Meadows in the country. Wow. Well, there you are, you see. <clears throat> so you learn something new every day. The expression Lammas is something that's completely uh, unfamiliar to me. So, um, 
that's an education in itself coming down here with you. No, Richard, let's go and find some fritillary. You're not looking let's very hard look. for no, fritillary. I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not looking at the moment. I'm just thinking how wonderful there's, uh, there's loads of meadow sweet foliage along the edge of this, this uh, the bund that sort of uh, just goes up to the up to these drainage channels, and that's uh, that's about pretty much an impact. What probably a month's time or something like that. That'll be. Uh, out in flower. Everything seems, it sort of seems early this year, I suppose, because we've had such a most amazing April imaginable. But but things, I don't think they are, you know. I think it's just because we're, we're sort of pushing things on a bit. I mean, the foliage in the trees isn't full yet, you know. I mean, if you look up into these ash trees on the bank here that just kind of breaks up what is the meadow and then the, the developed space of uh, Hereford City, you know, that's, uh, they're not out yet, are they? I mean, the ashes just no. aren't out yet. So I think that's probably a good sign, you know. Dots and gaps, aren't there? I think we might get a good summer. Yes. Well, let's, let's hope so. But I don't know. Fertilities, you know, I spent a, a long time down on these, um, these flats. When I, was a, when I was a kid, you know, sometimes when this area flooded, and uh, I remember one winter, the whole area, mm-hmm. uh, essentially probably dozens of square miles, froze up. It was solid. Mm-hmm. So we came down and we were sort of ice skating on you know, hundreds of acres of ice. It was the most amazing thing. It takes me back. It's a long time ago now. Have you ever seen any frogs spawn down here? I've never looked for frogs frog spawn. There's a broken bottle down there. Broken. Plastic bottle. <laughs> yeah, that's there's quite nice. Of crap that people throw in. But I've not looked for frog spawn down here. To be it's honest, it's quite deep. This channel, isn't it? I yes. If, um, but it's the sort of place you imagine froggies would go. Anyway, let's 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 carry on and uh, yeah. let's see if we can find these elusive fritillaries, and hopefully we'll we'll hear a curlew in a minute. Well, we can't hear any curlies, but what you can almost certainly hear now are a couple of skylarks competing for some airspace. They're wonderful things, you know, skylarks, you're trying to strain to see where they are in the sky and your, your eyes are all sort of starting to water because you're staring up into this really ridiculous sunlight. and. Uh, Eventually you can pick out this little black dot 300 metres up from the ground. It is the most wonderful time of year. I just think that everything about it is great. The fact that the evenings are still drawing out, you know, the weather's wonderful. That You've got babies of every conceivable creature emerging. It's kind of hard to beat, really. Our curlews are playing hard to get, certainly, but as we wander across here through this grass, which is probably oh, almost 18 inches high in places, it's certainly the clumps to me, of. Uh, Richard. It is. <laughs> 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 These are uh, some of the tallest stuff, you know, the cow parsley and the uh, creeping buttercup are uh, getting pretty enormous now. This is ideal nesting territory for for species like curlews you know and they'll they'll just hunker down in here they'll make a quite literally a scrape in the ground and they'll lay four eggs and incubate them for well, 28 days I think it is and then those little guys hatch and it's probably they're fledgling for about a month and a half you know so that's so you know you're looking at almost two and a half months of serious danger because they're rummaging around in this grass you know there's all sorts of opportunities for aerial attack by buzzards and carrying crows and magpies and all sorts of things not to mention the dog walkers and the dogs not to mention the dog walkers and the dogs yeah yeah and it's good that people you know it's one of the reasons why it's important to a to keep dogs on leads which no one ever seems to bother with and be to uh, to stick to footpaths because you know dogs would run through here and they could literally quite just trample the curlew's nest and frighten the hen bird off her eggs. But that's a risk they take, Richard, isn't it? It is. And I think this side of the uh, the lug flats is probably more prone to walkers than uh, mm. than the other side because there's more opportunity for people to drop down from the estates above us to to walk their dogs. Let's have a quick look down by the down by the river. 
I like this curve in the river here when you look back and you can see the grass on the bank just hanging over like a shaggy fringe. A shaggy fringe, eh? <laughs> I feel like Heather's hair. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> It's gorgeous to me. Mm. I mean, this, uh, you the, don't the way the willows it, hanging down. When yeah, and these banks are undercut, you don't aren't realize. they? And then you look, and it's all a bit yeah. patchy and yeah. quite cool. Yeah, that's fabulous. And there's a mallard just dropping down into the river up above us. The, 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 the mallard ducks. I mean, they've, they've got ducklings now. I've seen ducklings the last couple of weeks. You know, little families trying to keep up with their mother in a in a quick flowing current. Am I allowed to swear on the podcast? Oh, well, it depends, I suppose, how, uh, how you know, in, in terms of what sort of language you're, you're prone to use. The bastard mallards ate my fog spawn. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's perfectly acceptable. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a bit of a downside to, to ducks. They do enjoy a bit of glutinous spawn. This small stone here that looks like a... What do you call them? Road markers? Yeah. Or, that you or get on a miniature the, gravestone. Or a little gravestone here is one of the markers for the the strips for the the haymaking part of the Lammas Meadow. Now this has got 1994 on it, an HNT, which well, I imagine it stands for Hereford Nature Trust. So yeah. these ones are obviously newer, kind of replace the older ones. These are dotted all the way along to to mark out the strips that are owned by the different farmers. Oh, uh, wow. And when we go back, if we walk through the garden of the um, Nature Trust headquarters, which is, what's it called, Lower House Farm, amazing old timber frame building, yeah. you can see some of the original ones along the wall. Wow. We'll have a look. Fabulous. Let's go. I mean, we've just walked back across to the headquarters of the Nature Trust now, and... Uh, and these, so what do you think the significance of these stones are then, Rachel? And why are they all in one place? Do you think it's because they were sort of obstructing modern ways of, uh, of harvesting? You know, maybe they've just been brought back here to, to mark what was once present in the, uh, in the meadows. Well, no, because these stones have obviously been replaced by newer ones. Do you think? Well, you can see them. You know, we saw one yeah, we when saw we were walking one, along certainly. the bank. There's one. If you walk along the bank of the lug, you come across quite a few of them, right. just several of them, every few hundred yards. But I don't know why the old ones have been taken away and put here, <clears throat> no. and the new ones there. We could go in the Nature Trust and ask them. We could, we could go and ask, but I think, uh, I think we're running out of time today, <laughs> so uh, I think it's going to have to remain a mystery. But these are the old... Well, I don't know what, I'll find out then, I'll find out. But these are obviously the old ones. I mean, that one says 1857 Wareham WC on it. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether we can actually make out... It's a modern, another modern one. Oh, yeah, there's a Hope um, Nature Trust one. Oh, well. But here they are. Oh, well, fantastic. For some reason. Well, it's been a lovely morning, so uh, I suppose we should uh, head into our workplace now, then. The office. Right, to the office. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that, Rich. Actually, we've got curlews down at Campston, even though the ones here seem to have disappeared, that down at Campston on that permanent pasture... Any badgers down at Campston? And, well, rather fewer than here, in case you're caught. <laughs> but in, later on in the year, when it gets hotter and sunnier, that burbling noise that they make when they're flying is the most uplifting noise. You know, they are the most fabulous-sounding birds when they're flying. It's a bit like a sort of big, noisy skylark, isn't it? They're it is. Amazing things. Well, what we should do then, definitely, before uh, this spring, or, well, possibly even summer now, is out, we definitely need to get some curlew sounds on our We ought iPods. to try and record them. i tell you where else there's a good population of them. is just down at Madley here by the golf course. Oh, OK. There's a big rake of them there. All right. So we'll perhaps try that. Anyway... I've got some <laughs> feedback. Now, this feedback has taken some finding. Right. Because this is entitled The Wigglies and the Farmer, and it comes from Anthony Cumnick. Now, Anthony Cumnick lives in Victoria, in Australia, but for reasons that he's yet to explain to me, this piece of feedback is on the Canadian iTunes site. <laughs> Who knows? Well, this is my third attempt at trying to write a review, so obviously he's been struggling with this. <laughs> <laughs> and each time my session times out and I lose what I've written. So four stars, four stars oh. to the Wigglies and a one star for iTunes. Anyway, both Amanda, my wife, and I love the podcast and have listened to every episode and always look forward to each new episode. The show just has something for everyone and is at times, most of the time really, it's hilarious. 
Richard does some fascinating segments, not really. <laughs> but the ones I really liked... <laughs> yeah, milk it, Phil. Milk it, baby. <laughs> the ones I really liked were the Terry Walton oh. segments. Oh. As someone who is really just getting into vegetable gardening, I'm trying to soak up as much as I can, and you guys provide much food for fuel in this area. I have to say, though, and I apologise in advance, Richard, that I am consistently <laughs> siding with Farmer Phil, yes, <laughs> on all things agriculture. But don't let this little comment put you off, because it's always a great debate to listen to when you and FP get going, and a very useful debate. It's akin to city views versus rural views. Most of the ideals that you verbalise make great sense, but they are just that, and as we know, we don't live in an ideal world. We've now been on our farm of 1,100 acres here in Australia for just over a year, and I'd love nothing better to turn it into an organic or more sustainable, as I'm beginning to like the overused and misused term organic less and less. However, very few farmers in this economic and meteorologic... He, he's real good words going yeah, on, I can see why he's run out of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah me. Climate can afford to do so, and don't get me started about the leeches that produce our fertilisers. How can a company justify doubling the price of fertiliser, crying their costs have risen, and turn around and publish a 100% increase in the year's profits? But I digress. Hmm? I think a lot of farmers realise that we have to change, but the about face that is required is much like the ocean liner and it takes time. Anyway, this is a review about you, not about the farming margins being squeezed. <laughs> but this just proves what a thought... They can't help themselves, <laughs> Farmers, they just can't help themselves. This just proves what a thought-provoking show you guys put out. I very nearly gave you five stars. Ah. However, the days of our lives, not that I watch days of our lives, I assume this is a TV programme, type cliffhanging ending to last week's episode where FP's moisture reading segment on the grain wasn't completed, lost you a star. That was your fault, Ricardo, for going on so much, wasn't it? <laughs> I think a great idea for a true five-star rating podcast would be to give Farmer Phil his own podcast. <gasps> well, we've, we've oh, suggested good it. Lord. The Lower Blakemere Farm Podcast, or the FPP. Farmer Phil Podcast would do the trick. I think he's a great ambassador for the agriculture sector. Oh, oh my God. He's not a boy. Yeah, yeah. And I, for one, would be a keen follower of such a podcast. Anyway, keep up the fantastic words. You guys are really doing a fantastic job, Anthony. Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for that, uh, Anthony. Yeah. Oh, yes, Phil. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much just indeed. Just one yes, minute. Yeah. And where do I feature in it? Um, well, I'm sorry to tell you that apart from in general... <laughs> Presumably being included in the phrase you guys, you don't. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony and Amanda. I hope you enjoyed the Terry tips last week. And uh, next review, perhaps you could mention me, 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 me. Oh, oh only joking. Right then, Ricardo, what I want to know about is veggie plots. Right. Now... So all ours are going out now then, you say? All, all our veggie plots, ones are heading yeah. out. To various places all over the country, yeah. yeah for they come to start from planting Cornwall, up. Yeah. and off they go all over the place, as yeah. you know, yeah. to be planted up. Right. I mean, we've done growing from seed. You've nursed me through this period, haven't uh -huh. you? Growing yeah. from seed, those well, so. lettuce leaves and things. I'm so. having a lot of fun with those. Good. And I didn't know that seeds were such different shapes. Uh, Marigolds are spikes. Oh, I suppose they are, yeah, yeah. Salsify that I planted last year, they're a ridiculously long, grass-like seed you know mm. huge great big spiky thing but anyway these will come as plugs right so what i want to know is i want that to be know... 13 amp or 5 amp <laughs> uh, well. i want to know so your plot arrives on thursday yeah you're at home you can't plant it until saturday right and your beds are dug over but not particularly ready what do I have to do well, they, to they, make those they, um, plants grow like mad? Water is, uh, is a key thing, really, with plants. You know, I, so the more I think about gardening, the more I talk about gardening, the more I think how ridiculously easy gardening is. It is so easy that anybody could do it. And it's just to make it complicated, as I've heard some, some speakers um, do so in the past, is, is obscene, really, because it's so straightforward. And, that, and planting plugs is, is, is really uh, taking it to another level in terms of straightforwardness. So you just get your plugs, right, and you quite literally put them in the soil, firm the soil around the roots and water liberally, and that will uh, set them off in good stead. And generally, spacing-wise, 
Is there so a that rule? depends what you've got. The idea is to sort of visualise how big that plant's going to turn out. Yeah. Right? So if you've got a purple sprouting plant, for instance, then it's going to have a span of probably be 18 inches, something like that, ultimately. So you'd want to put that um, as far apart from its chum as it, as it needs in order to fulfil that kind of dimensions. If you've got a lettuce, right, bog standard, cut and come again lettuce, it would have a span of, say, I don't know, eight inches, something like that. Yep. So then you'd think, well, you get your little lettuce plants and quite literally plant them six or eight inches apart. That'll be absolutely fine. It doesn't matter if lettuce compacts against its neighbour too much, you know. Equally, if you're prone to mega slug attack, it's worth having space around your plants because if they are really close together and there's quite a lot of contact, then all those little mollusks can spend more time munching because they're better protected from the elements and the warmth of the sun and things like that. So I've gone out into my garden, I've worked it down into a reasonably fine tilth, I've planted my plug plants, I've watered them. Yeah. I will have spent a bit of money on this, so it's yeah. not like a seed where it's cost me, no. you know, a tenth of a pence or something. Right. It's significant, isn't it? It's, it's so I need to make sure that I do Everyone's harvest a winner. Yeah. the crop. Everything. Yeah. And actually, so, you know, you should, you should really, every single plant that you receive in the form of a plug plant should mature into a reasonably sized thing to harvest from. But I'm a beginner. Right. So what am I looking out for? So I go and water regularly, that's easy. Yep. And I don't water when it's really sunny, because you've already told me that. Uh, no, you, can, you could water when it's really sunny. Right. But the, 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 it's not going to harm the plants in any way, but it's, it's counterproductive in, in the sense that it, the more water is going to evaporate. Right. So you will have to water less if you water at the end of the day where <clears throat> the water has time to sink into the soil and be taken up by the roots rather than be evaporated by the, by the strong sun during the day. Yeah. So it makes sense to water at the end of the day, but you but, can water in the But what I've found in the past is it's all going quite well. I'm dreaming along and watering a bit of this and that. Yeah. And I wake up one day and the whole thing has been eaten. Right. And I think, oh... It's a that funny is thing, you know. Shame. I, I, you know, I go around and I look at and I see various gardens and I and I, you know, mingle with various people that garden and, and I often see people with their little slug pellets in their pots and things like that. And I look at them and I think you don't need those slug pellets. My garden, right, is situated in in a field essentially, isn't it? You know, you've yeah. seen it's on the edge of a field and it's on a, in a field. And I've never ever used slug pellets ever. And, I've never, and I swear on my life that I would never use slug pellets. I've, ne- I've just never even thought about it, you know. And yes, I do get some slug predation, but it's not a problem. It's not a problem in terms of, of the quantities that I can harvest. You know, we get as many vegetables as we need and salads right through the year and more so plenty to freeze and the like. And I would just, and, you know, it amazes well, me. I just find it quite frustrating, really. I think, oh, why do, you know, why do folks need, to, why do they think they need to do it? Because it's just impoverishing their environment by using them. It's just I do find it frustrating. I never say anything because you know you kind of it must vary joints, according but... to your soil type. And also you can if you're not going to use slug bait, you can use sacrificial plants, can't you? If there's you lots. Plant... Of, I mean, there's loads of different ways to deter slugs. Actually, one of the best ways to deter slugs is use a raised bed. You know, I mean, the raised bed, the predation that you get out here in the raised beds that are out in the Wiggly Garden. And is that because they can't it's climb up? Negligible, here? really. It's not that they can't climb up hill, but it makes life difficult for them. They have fewer places to hide and take refuge during the daytime. And, I'd uh, imagine you get a better soil structure that it's firmer and they can't move around. They need to move around in the soil to breed successfully. Yeah, and well, that's the problem breed, with the legs in slugs the soil, in the agricultural situation is that it's quite difficult to get the ground firm enough to stop them doing that, which is where we have to resort to slug bellets. In a raised bed, you can get a nice firm seed bed. They can't move around as quickly. You've got a finite area so that you can pick them off yeah. because that fairly obviously stops them breeding as well. And also, if you use something like nemo slug or a slug trap, you know, a physical yep. slug trap, again, because it's a finite area, you're not trying to catch slugs from far and wide. You only pr- need to protect a smallish area. Yep. So on the All those things were absolutely great. You know, nemo slugs, you know, the wiggle away nematodes, the slug X traps, you know, using barriers like... like you just mix it up, you know, use, all, use your imaginations, be creative, you know. Don't put slug pellets on the garden, you know, I just... I just cannot believe that you gardeners like need that, to do, do it. You? I don't. It just it makes you cross. It, I find it upsetting. Yes. You know. I think you're it right. It shows. It shows a lack of integrity. I think 
I appreciate that I will almost certainly have insulted thousands of people <laughs> when I've said that. Well, don't let but, that put you uh, off. You know, just, just, you know, just pull your socks up. You, know, yeah. don't, you don't need to do it. Why do you want to compromise your environment, but certainly the, the environment for all the other creatures around you? You know, it's just ultimately you're making a rod for your own back. You're an evil person. <laughs> Bad, evil, <laughs> evil person. You just need to get a life. But before we before we finish, well, it's in my head. You're watering, right? Yes. Now the key with watering is lots of folks don't water, and I don't water very often. The key to watering really is when it's when it is dry and when plants are really struggling. You know, is to water saturate your raised beds rather than water frequently. Water occasionally and plentifully rather than frequently and half-heartedly. But is there anything else, Rich? You know, oh, I listen to Gardener's Question Time. Do you? Well, I, it's on a Sunday, you see, and it's after just a minute. And, <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, it's all so complicated, you know, feeding stuff, you know, like tomatoes and doing this and that. And yeah. I just think, oh, what happens is I can't remember the information and so it puts me off actually right. doing anything. I'll tell you what, it's a funny thing, you know. I listened. I was listening to, it was probably Radio 4 or something, and I was listening to one commentator, I won't say who it was, and Go they on. were talking about... No, I won't say who it was. Oh. It's not, well, I tried to get an interview with that person, so I wanted to stop them before I do that. <laughs> no, but, but equally, the, um, the, 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 she was talking about growing tomatoes, and, and it, I've never heard anything so uh, obscenely complicated in all my life. You mm. know, tomatoes are a piece of cake to grow. Growing them outside, it, it can be difficult, but only because of our weather. But if you've got a greenhouse, then all a tomato really needs is good stuff around its roots. So, uh, you know, a nice, uh, nutritious compost around its roots, plenty of moisture, and, and possibly feeding once a week when it starts to fruit. Uh, so, if you've, got, if you've got your with? worm pea, so all ah. you need to do is tap off a bit of worm pea in your watering can, feed it once a week. Jobs are good. But actually, to be perfectly honest, you will get, probably you get fewer tomatoes if you don't feed, but you will still get tomatoes even if you don't feed as long as your compost is good. Well, what a relief. It's probably true to say also, Rich, that if you have grow it so you have fewer tomatoes, they will tend to be sweeter. If you have a, a large crop of tomatoes yeah. or anything else of a plant, you dilute the taste. Well, doesn't that smack of everything? You know, yeah. it's, 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 it's the way it is. I and mean, that's why tomatoes, in fact, tomatoes grown outside are, are invariably more tasty than tomatoes grown in greenhouses as well because the, the plant has got access to different types of nutrients, grows in a slightly different way. The fruits take slightly longer to develop, but they're sweeter and tastier. But, than, Rich, you told me to put my tomatoes in a greenhouse, so should I put them out in a minute? Uh, no, don't put them out yet. That's the other thing. Because oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you don't want to put oh. anything out uh, really pointing. until the end of May. Right. Um, um, because the tomatoes are particularly susceptible to frost. Chances are, you know, we might get a bit of a cold snap. Well, it's quite lucky. I mean, that's the thing you see at the moment. It's really tempting, isn't it, to put your tomatoes outside. Oh, it's it's beautiful. It is stunning, and it's not cold, you know, because I've been wandering around at 3 o'clock every morning for the last couple of weeks. They go, oh, it's all right out here, you know, can't wait till the summer. At least you and, had uh, your clothes on. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's quite right. <laughs> I have. I've been fully clad, certainly. Uh, but... Um, if you've got a greenhouse, then it makes sense to grow tomatoes in your greenhouse as well as a few outside, because at least you're sure you're going to get some tomatoes. If we have a crap summer again, then there's no guarantee that if you're growing tomatoes outside, you'll get any. Unfortunately, I haven't got a greenhouse because I, uh, I, I told you that I sold yeah. the thing a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to, my project next uh, summer, <laughs> one of them next summer, is to build a greenhouse. Now, for those gardeners who are complete beginners and are thinking about a greenhouse... And you've heard, you know, all the talk about cleaning it out and how difficult it is and the windows and the doors and everything about it. And it's all so difficult. Now, I am a very new greenhouse person and I can tell you exactly why you must get one. And that is this. You go out in the garden, you get a bit cold and you've got your flask and then you go in your greenhouse and you sit in there doing absolutely nothing and you boil. And it's just like being oh, on holiday. No. It's my new holiday. <laughs> How event. old is she? She's going to have a bottle of sherry in there next, <laughs> isn't she? It's <laughs> fantastic. And I think, I hope nobody's going by because they're seeing me 
sitting in there. You'll have a big <laughs> cooking. Being hot. A you big bottle of cooking sherry. Yeah, you would need to. Yeah. Well, it's a, yeah. well, it's a, it is. A, it's, well, I suppose it's the same principle. Though folks have. Uh, I mean, mum's got a summer room. You know, where it's all kind of yes, piled and Yes, but greenhouses are always thing. made out to be it's this. It's you know, oh, hot. It's, I mean, I remember going to my uncle Bill's, and it was all so complicated. There was this heater and this nozzle and this compost and this. Thing. Well, just have one if you've got the chance, because you can get hot in there. It's like just like going on holiday at home. Uh, Here I'm we glad, are. I'm glad you've, you've, you've got it into your greenhouse. As, as well as <laughs> you have. So yeah, go, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so here we have the latest... Well, actually, okay. this one's a, a couple of weeks ago. Another little, another review. This is uh, Gardening, Farming and More with a Wiggle. How many stars, Rich? Astonite. Five stars. Oh, good. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Uh, yes, they eat your heart out, Anthony. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is my favourite podcast as it makes me laugh, but is also very informative. A lifetime country dweller and previous young farmer, I have mm. to say I have learnt more about farming from listening to the Wiggly podcast than anything else. Well, that's, that's more of a tribute to Farmer Phil than, uh, than either you or I have, I think, possibly. Mm. The gardening Farmer information is again. great too oh. and always inspires me to go out and get digging. I listen on my iPod while at the stable and Heather, Ricardo, Farmer Phil and the others really make you feel part of the team. Great facts from Monty too. Have a listen, but I warn you, it's addictive. Fab. Ash denied. One more. Oh, another one here. This is a cliffhanger, eh? OK, and that's going to almost look like six stars in there, but it, <laughs> it is actually possible. Well, it could uh, be. You'd have to make up for Anthony then, wouldn't it? Uh, Hoping shopkeeper. Oh, I think this is Christine Hope from Hopes at Long Town. Uh, it doesn't yeah. say that, but... No, no, but it's... it's, yeah. it's, it's I think <laughs> it's, it's a good it's guess. Well, it's a fair, it's a fair it's, assumption. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Anyway, so Christine, <laughs> <laughs> we found you out. Yeah, yeah. I love this podcast, and the title music gently lifts me into a different world. The show is light-hearted, and Heather's giggle is a corker. This minute, oh, oh, oh. but the topics are real <laughs> and deadly serious. Sadly, just Very like true. any good soap, the current cliffhanger 176 has got me gripped. Let's hope Farmer Phil wins his battle. To prove justice can prevail. Oh, that was the great. So presumably, it was a weak, the, the weak scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, did, what, did you get back in the end? Did it come back in the end? Or they agreed that I was right and that they have paid all expenses. And we've got fingers crossed because actually, this very morning, they've taken the fifth load of that contract. And I'm going to be very interested to see what happens when it gets there. Well done. Warms the cockles of your heart. I've had two special invites. I'm off to Hertfordshire Agricultural Society Food and Farming Debate on the 22nd of May, so next oh, week. Nice. And there is a formidable panel consisting of Anthony Gibson, past National Farmers Union Head of Communications, me, Clarissa Dixon Wright. All right. I'm very pleased about that. She's a chef. Well, I suppose she would be called a celebrity chef, would she? Oh, I guess. I'm not sure whether she'd appreciate being called a celebrity chef. She's more mm. of a kind of a country woman, I think, possibly. Absolutely. Mm. Chris Burt Brown, who is the Head of Ethical and Sustainable Purchasing for ASDA. <laughs> Do really? those go together? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he's a, I'm sure he's a very nice chap. I've met him before. Uh, that's Walmart, of course. And Guy Smith, who is very famous in agricultural world. He farms the driest farm in the UK. He does, and he's part of the NFU, and he's done a lot of, for communications in farming, and he is chairing the proceedings. He's also the driest farm in the UK? an award-winning journalist. Yes, where's okay. the driest farm in the He UK? farms in Essex on the coast. There oh. we are. And my second invite is, well, I'm really pleased about this one, Having not been to university, as we know, I've been invited to summer school at the Royal Agricultural College. I'm a speaker, and the lunch to start it off is at Highgrove, hosted by... Charlie Boy. Ah. There I'm really are. pleased. How do you have half lift? Hey, oh, nice. <laughs> I'll be able to go to the toilet again and think about what my mum would think about me being in the toilet at Highgrove. So I can't wait for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, Garden Rich... It's coming up next week. Are we ready? Uh, yes, I think we're definitely ready, yes. 
Was that prompt then when you, when you <laughs> shook your head? We are yeah, ready, yeah. Richard. The Hay Garden is, uh, is going to be... If we're uh, ready, Rich, that'll be a first for you. Superb this year. Superb. I, I was born ready, Phil. I was born ready. <laughs> now, I saw Jodie this morning, actually, uh, and she's uh, definitely on the case for the big plant up. So, of course, we've got our lovely little uh, uh, marshy area, or should we call it moisture-retentive uh, area, because... Uh, um, I'm not supposed to... Are we supposed to have a marshy area? Oh, now we must no have to know. standing water at Hay Festival. No. So, so there will be no standing water standing at Hay water. Festival <laughs> on our garden, but right. everywhere I was else gonna say, will be uh, flooded. Uh, uh, was it last year uh, that they were canoeing down they, the car park? Yeah. They seriously yeah. did ban us from having a pond, despite the fact that our garden was the only place that didn't have a pond because <laughs> the whole showground was, uh, yeah, was a pond but we'd also yeah. like to say thank you very very much to Jules. Jules Clothing are the well they're a mail order company that do lovely clothes and uh, they do wellies yep. and they've given us 120 wellies I can't find a pair you know cannot find a pair they're all, <laughs> are they all left they're all odd, odd. um I've got some odd wellies, so yeah. perhaps we, you know. But the idea came because the festival folks wanted people to be able to walk on our garden, and I was very much against that because, you know, 100,000 people go and we wouldn't have a garden left. No. So we came up with the idea of having wellies walking on the garden, and so Jodie has kindly planted them up with veggies, bee plants, wildflowers, and oh, all sorts. Tomatoes. Tomatoes, Tomatoes. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, so hay coming up next week. Uh, I think that's all from us, isn't it? I think we've uh, we've covered a lot of ground in this yeah, episode. Yeah, we have. Welcome to Betty TV, who are coming here to film the Dream Farm. There's two lasses from Kent that want to grow some flowers, and they want to know how Wiggly Wigglers put their bouquets together. So uh, you'll see us on Betty TV. It's with Monty Dom very soon. Very good. And good luck to Roz Savage, who is just about to get in her little boat. But it's quite a big boat, isn't it? For a little person to row the distance she rows it, it seems enormous to me, but yeah. she seems quite happy with the idea. I know, I bet she's got some stamina, you know. Ooh. <laughs> Steady. <laughs> she has an altogether doubtful effect on you, doesn't she? <laughs> good luck to Roz Savage, the oceanic rower who is about to go on the leg from Hawaii to Tuvalu on the second leg of her Trans-Pacific row. Which, when she's completed it, will make her the first woman to have rowed the Pacific. Wow. Rock on, Roz. Good old Roz. Good luck, Roz. Row, Roz, row. So, from our 181 episode it's goodbye bye from me too and it's bye from me bye